Hello everyone and welcome to the 10th episode of the Henry Schein webinar series on COVID-19. I'm Dr. Gary Severance and just like we do each week I'm going to turn it over to Dr. David Resnick for his clinical update. Dr. Resnick? Thank you, Gary. Um, it's great to be back with everyone again for this week, and we're going to have a little bit of a clinical update, and then we're going to go over uh, a little bit on how to um, make sure that the masks that you're buying or the facial respirators that you're buying are, are actually legitimate. So I'll go over a few different things. I do want to state, though, that one size does not fit all. Just like this epidemic is hitting uh, or pandemic is hitting certain parts of our country harder than it is others, we do have different kinds of, of uh, ways. So I hope that the information that we're sharing is helping you to uh, plan the reopening of your practice or safely reopen your practice and then um, give you a little bit of information to maybe show you that the risk is still there, that we're going to have to live with this for a while, and how um, the steps that you can take to make sure that you maintain a safe environment for you, your teams, and your teams and your family members. I do want to talk a little bit about um, super spreaders. I think that that's something that we can show up in any environment and we need to be aware of it. Uh, I think you might be aware that there was a biotech company that had a big meeting in Boston earlier this year and there was a super spreader and a lot of people um, at that meeting ended up uh, converting to or ended up having COVID-19. The, the case I have in front of you is a two and a half hour choir practice that had 61 members, including one person who was symptomatic, so someone who was sick there were 32 confirmed and 20 probable uh, COVID cases, so up to 86 or 87 percent. Three patients were hospitalized and two regretfully passed away. So transmission was, low, uh, was, was uh, basically one, because people were in close contact, but two, because people were singing. And when you sing, you're producing an aerosol, just like when you talk, you produce an aerosol, or when you cough, or when you sneeze, you produce an aerosol. So we can't forget that we, you have to be careful no matter what environment you're in, because there could be a super spreader or someone who doesn't know. Remember, you can have this disease for a couple days and not know that you're infected or you could have this disease and really just be pre-symptomatic. So we have different levels of this disease. To give you a sort of a visual though, if you look at this choir, you have this one person in red who was the super spreader or the person who was infected in close contact with these other people in the group. And you can see the vast majority of people developed COVID-19 or symptoms consistent with COVID-19. So it does spread very easily. And of course, we're at remarkable risk and we need to take as much care as possible. I also want to talk about it's summer, our patients are coming back, and skin is a great diagnostic. Just like you can't be healthy without oral health and the mouth is a window to the rest of the body, we can see changes in the mouth a lot of times uh, before we see some other physical changes. Um, the skin is also a great way uh, to give you hints that something is going on that isn't right. So I'm going to go over a little bit of some derm lesions because we do see our patients' arms and possibly legs and they might ask us some questions. So very briefly, just going over a little bit of the dermatological management manifestations that we're seeing. Uh, the first is COVID toes. I might have mentioned this before. Um, there's a couple hypotheses on why we're seeing this, but it's a lot of inflammation that's caused by the virus. Um, it resembles pernio, which is exposure to cold temperatures. Now, I'm from the South, and I really don't see a lot of cold temperatures, and you might be a whole lot more familiar with this than I am, but it does result in inflammation, which can appear as skin or sores or bumps. The other theory is that the symptom is due to really small blood vessel clotting. You might have heard that there are some issues with some people producing more clots than one would expect with this disease. Children are also impacted uh, by this disease, and, and we've heard a little bit about things that look like Kawasaki's disease. Um, I have some pictures here from the NIH on the right, um, and you can see this is the first time I've seen any kind of 
oral manifestations seen and associated with this systemic disease. Remember, my background is in HIV, and at the beginning of our epidemic, almost 90 to 95 percent of all patients presented with some kind of oral lesion seen in association with uh, with uh, uh, that pandemic. And here we really haven't seen much. We do see some skin things, but in children, you can see glossitis. And they show with this multi-system inflammatory condition, um, it, it, it can show up with an erythematous rash on their hands, conjunctivitis, GI distress, and cardiac inflammation. So we do know that younger people tend to do better, but please watch out for your small children because this is something that we're seeing in New York and in different parts of our country. Some of the other dermatological uh, conditions that we see, you've got your vesicular, your macupopular eruptions, um, and we're going to go over just some brief examples of these. Uh, again, talking about chill veins, this, which is a painful inflammation of small blood vessels in your skin. Uh, often in uh, response to repeated exposure to cold, but not freezing air. And for someone from the South like me, I thought that was sort of interesting. It can cause itching, bread patching, swelling, and blisters on your hands and feet. And it normally cleans up in one to three weeks, especially when the weather gets warmer, which we're seeing now. Hives, and you can see these welts that are on here on the skin. They itch something fierce. Uh, sometimes they can cause a dangerous swelling. Sometimes it's an allergic reaction. It could be an autoimmune reaction. We see this a lot that it, when it pops up, um, and it can be very, um, the itching can be very uh, problematic, honestly. This was a really interesting presentation that I saw. It's one of the most common. It shows up as a lace-like purplish discoloration of the skin. And it's caused by the swelling of venules owning to obstruction, again, by thrombi or little mini clots. And it shows this pattern of this purple pattern, which is sort of an interesting skin manifestation. Again, just giving you some idea that it's not just upper respiratory. It's not those 14 symptoms that we go over all the time of coughing and a fever, a shortness of breath, that there are skin uh, manifestations or dermatological manifestations as well. So as we know... We've all had a challenge getting our practices open. And one of our biggest challenges that we faced or that we're facing as we open our practices, do we have enough personal protective equipment? So the ADA has actually asked Congress to expand the non-payroll cost allowable during the Paycheck Protection Program to include PPE as a cost for our offices. And we do have issues with the availability of N95 equivalents or better. I think it's also important to note that, that although we're sharing the information as it comes out, the American Dental Association has urged the CDC to update its guidance for dental practices, and that came up um, during uh, this week when uh, Dr. Redfield uh, testified in front of the Senate. Um, uh, Susan Collins uh, did bring up some points about dentistry that were always greatly appreciated, but we really do need to have a good set of guidance so that people People can follow them no matter where you are in our country. So again, just a little bit of review. Um, these are, we always talk about N95s and KN95s, which come from uh, Europe. The FFP2 uh, is actually, I mean, K95, which comes from China. The FFP2 comes from the European Union. It uh, gets 94% of the particles. Um, I haven't really heard much about us having access for FFP2, but if you can, that's fine. But my concern, and, and I actually have the authorized use in NIOSH approved masks, so here's a link on this slide, but I am concerned about counterfeit respirators or misrepresentation of NIOSH approval. Um, and I think some of these things that we're going to talk about to a degree are, are common sense. If something looks like the deal is too good to be true, it's probably too good to be true. So if somebody is offering N95s at, or KN95s um, at a remarkably reduced rate during this period of time, probably not getting what you want. Um, there are some 
Are there obvious signs when people do this? If they don't have a business account address, that they're using a public address, like an email address, like a Gmail account or something that anybody can set up in a very brief period of time. I'm just wanting to make sure that we protect ourselves because we have seen some N95s that say they're in 95s, but really, if you look at it, they're in 30s. They're really only taking about 30% of the particulate matter, and they're allowing 70% to come through, and I don't like the chances on that. So I know that some of these things are out there. I'm constantly being bombarded by companies uh, from all over the planet trying to sell me N95s at this point, or KN95s for ridiculous prices, and I'm sure you are as well. So, NIOSH approved resp respirators do have an approval label. Um, actually, one of my favorite things is that they know how to spell NIOSH, uh, which we'll see an example where that's one of the worst uh, uh, counterfeits I've seen. Um, and you can always uh, verify the approval number by the links on this uh, slide. Some signs that the respirators might be counterfeit. No markings at all on the filtering face piece respirator or the FFR as it's uh, uh, referred to. No approval number on the filtering face piece respirator or headband. No NIOSH markings. And NIOSH spelled incorrectly. And, and here's one of those examples that I took from the internet where instead of spelling NIOSH, they spelled it NISH. So I'm just saying, please beware of some of the really obvious things. And I'll be frankly honest, I'm not going to be able to, one, have the time, or two, have even the knowledge base to go through and figure out what's legitimate and what's not legitimate. We have some wonderful people that we work with. Um, no matter who your distributor is, I will say you have wonderful sales reps that are at this point, I think, going a little bit, uh, uh, well, I think they're being worked to death right now trying to get people's offices up and running. Um, but I'm depending on these companies to do the research. I'll be frankly honest. Uh, a local company in Georgia looked, and they could only find two legitimate uh, manufacturers of N95s. Um, so I think that we really have to be careful about what we're purchasing, knowing we want to do the right thing to protect our staff, our team, our families, but also realizing if it's too good, think about it. Other signs that a respirator might be counterfeit is the presence of a decorative fabric or other decorative add-ons. Uh, for instance, um, I grew up in Tampa, Florida. I am waiting for my Tampa Bay Buccaneer masks. Um, they are not here yet, um, and I'm a little bit upset, but those won't be N95 masks. Those will be just masks to walk through the hallways with. If a claim for an approval for a child, NIOSH does not approve any type of respiratory protection for children. So if it says it's safe for children, so you can take them out in the park or whatever, please, again, it, it, it's not real. And filtering face piece respirators have ear loops, which are, you know, these ear loops that you would see in a surgical mask like this, as opposed to the headbands, which uh, are there. Another example of counterfeit that is not as obvious as someone misspelling NIOSH, which I really, I'm not exactly over that one yet, is an example of a counterfeit respirator here where Medicos is selling an N95 respirator using the Moldix approval number and label without Moldix permission. Medicos is not a NIOSH approval holder or private label holder. And if you go to the CDC's website on counterfeit masks, they have an exhaustive list. So there are a lot of people out there who are trying to take advantage of, of a crisis. So examples of exterior markings that should be on a NIOSH-approved filtering face piece respirator are the approval number, the model number, lot number, filter class, is it NP or R, its efficiency, is it 95, 99, or 100. The NIOSH name in block letters are in their logo, and then the brand name or registered trademark. Please remember if you're reprocessing or you have someone that can reprocess the, these masks, do not write on them. Please don't write on your N95s and do not get your N95s wet. Um, I, I'm going to save you the torture of watching me try to doff and don on uh, 
PPE, but that's a constant question that comes up on these uh, uh, these webinars. And so what I did was get some very short CDC videos for you that will enable you to see how to safely put on uh, PPE, how to don it, and how to doff it, and how to do it in an order where you're not recontaminating. I know these are simple things, and some, and we've been doing this kind of work, many of us, for a very long time, but a little review is always a little bit, it's, it's very helpful. So again, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to visit with you this week. And Gary, it's back to you. And thank you again for the opportunity. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Resnick, for your weekly contributions. I'm now joined by my wife, Angela. Hi, everyone. I'm Angela Severance, dental assistant and dental educator. And it's my pleasure to be here with you today to share with you a new category in dentistry, OPE, Office Protective Equipment. And particularly today, we'll discuss a subcategory, air management. As dental professionals, we're certainly proud of dentistry always being listed in the top 100 job rankings by U.S. News and World Report. And even in the rankings for the top 100 jobs in 2020, dentists, dental specialists, hygienists, and dental assistants were all listed. But at the same time, even prior to this pandemic, Dentistry was listed as the unhealthiest profession using data from the U.S. Department of Labor. Okay. This study rated 968 occupations and ranked them according to their exposure to contaminants, disease and infections, hazardous conditions, radiation, risk of minor burns, cuts, bites, and stings, and finally, time spent sitting. You can see that four of the top five unhealthiest jobs were in dentistry. Only the vet assistant interrupted our run. The dental professional is especially vulnerable to exposure to contaminants, disease, and infections, most noticeably fine and ultrafine particulate matter. If you look at the chart, it's interesting to also notice that the dental assistant is the only one of the group that didn't have time sitting, the pink bar, as one of their top three risks. As you know, we're typically running all around the office, moving from operatory to operatory to sterilization to seating patients and getting everything set up. Obviously, this may change as we move forward to the new dental experience. The air quality of a dental office is not visible, yet contains unhealthy and often infectious airborne particulate, which often results just from practicing dentistry. The high traffic public access of dental offices can introduce bacterial, viral, and fungal infections into the air. In addition, the furniture, dental equipment, and flooring can produce harmful airborne volatile organic compounds. Aerosols from the use of high-speed hand pieces and ultrasonic instruments, along with the cleaning and disinfection of contact surfaces, adds to increasing the unhealthiness of indoor air of dental offices. Poor indoor air quality can lead to headaches, dryness and irritation of the eyes, nose and throat, coughing and sneezing, shortness of breath, dizziness, and nausea. Dental offices HVAC systems redistribute and recirculate harmful airborne contaminants that worsen the already poor indoor air quality. In addition, HVAC systems tend to lower indoor humidity, which actually allows the micro droplets of contaminants to stay airborne longer. It's interesting to note that back in 2011, Dr. Paul Feirstein emphasized in a dental economics article that while our HVAC systems do a great job of recirculating the air, they also do a great job of recirculating airborne particles around the entire office. The dental profession is mandated to sterilize instruments, disinfect surface contaminants, and use precautionary protocols. But indoor air quality and extraoral aerosol management have not been emphasized as a priority until now. The importance of managing indoor air quality and aerosols to prevent the spread of viral and bacterial infections is of extreme importance. Infection control professionals describe the chain of infection as a process in which a pathogen, a microbe that causes disease, is carried in an initial host and gains access to a route of ongoing transmission, then finds a secondary susceptible host. Ventilation, filtration, air distribution systems, and disinfection technologies have the potential to limit airborne pathogen transmission through the air and thus break the cycle of the infection. 
OSHA, in its guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19, has placed dental professionals in the very high exposure risk, the top of the occupational risk pyramid for COVID-19. They've also listed engineering controls that focus on isolating employees from work-related hazards. Engineering infection controls for COVID-19 prevention include installing high-efficiency air filters, increasing ventilation rates in the work environment, installing physical barriers such as clear plastic sneeze guards, specialized negative pressure ventilation in some settings, such as for aerosol generating procedures, and possibly installing a drive through window for customer service. Now a drive through window for a dental office may seem a little far-fetched, but who knows about the future? With payments, possible testing, pickup of the liners, or teledentistry opportunities, really anything is possible. We need to always look for ways to limit the exposure while still being effective and productive as a profession. Dentistry is essentially a profession that creates aerosols during routine procedures through the use of high-speed handpieces, ultrasonics, and air water syringes. The Environmental Protection Agency has offered a three-step approach to controlling air pollutants, and they can be directly related to air management in the dental offices. Number one is source control, number two, ventilation, and three, air cleaning. The FDA has also just provided guidance by saying in the context of the COVID-19 public health emergency, it is necessary to maintain an adequate supply of sterilizers, disinfection devices, and air purifiers that can facilitate rapid turnaround of sterilized or disinfected metal equipment and help reduce the risk of viral exposure for patients and healthcare providers in this pandemic. It is also suggested to not rely on a single precautionary strategy. A single step will reduce the risk of infection by a certain percentage. However, infection control is additive, so adding or layering each step will reduce the remaining risk. Of the three steps, source control is the most effective. This involves the use of rubber dams, high volume intraoral suction and dry angles that capture the majority, about 90 to 95% of the aerosols within the mouth. Providing your patient with pre-procedural uh, antimicrobial rinse while not necessarily reducing aerosols can reduce the level of oral microorganisms in those aerosols. Source control also involves minimizing the use of products, techniques, and materials that cause aerosols. Employ good hygiene practices to minimize biological contaminants and use good housekeeping practices to control particles. Another source control is considering prioritization of minimally invasive atraumatic restorative techniques by using only hand instruments. Another option is technologies that reduce the aerosol production while providing effective techniques. One example is an all-tissue laser for the preparation of direct and indirect partial coverage restorations. It uses reduced water and air pressure compared to a handpiece, thus reduced spray and spatter. In addition, a CO2 laser delivers energy that serves as essentially a sterilizing agent. Obviously, however, the laser plume must still be addressed. The use of digital impression systems can limit the possible aerosol production versus handling conventional impressions out of the mouth and then using an air water syringe to aid in visual inspection. Sending an image or file via the internet versus sending a physical impression minimizes saliva traveling out of the mouth, around the office, and to a dental laboratory through the mail. Other technologies like chair-side milling units and printers can minimize infection control turnover of operatories and PPE by maximizing production during a single visit. At the same time, employing chair-side CAD-CAM dentistry reduces the number of provisionals in place should any situation occur where visits are limited or prohibited. The second approach, ventilation in the dental office, can include placing a high-speed extraoral evacuation system close to the source of the contaminant which is the patient's mouth, and additionally increasing air flows in mechanical ventilation systems, HVAC systems. The third approach, air cleaning, is generally not regarded as sufficient by itself, but is used in addition to source control and ventilation. Air filters, electronic particle air cleaners, and ionizers are often used to remove airborne particles and volatile organic compounds. Benefits of air purification and ventilation include 
overall well-being and health of the dental team, patient health and wellness, and a positive patient impression of the dental practice. Studies have also proven that purified indoor air leads to higher worker productivity. Importantly, it results in lower absence due to health issues, specifically respiratory illnesses. Dental offices can greatly benefit from purifying their indoor air with air purification systems by reducing the transmittable contaminants. Air purification and filtration systems clean by constantly drawing out polluted indoor air and exhausting clean filtered air into each room. Most of the products offered either clean or purify the air through a combination of the following. An airflow filtering process using HIPAA, MERV, or carbon filters. Use of shielded UV light, UV germicidal irradiation and photocatalytic oxidation, and ionization of the air, negative ion purification. When we talk about the particulates in the air that we are either trying to filter out or inactivate through different technologies, you can see there is a wide variety of sizes. And while we know the coronavirus is essentially 0.125 microns in diameter, it is normally carried airborne by particles and droplets well over a micron in size. 0.3 micron particles are listed as the most penetrating particle size and sets the standard measurement for effectiveness of filters. HEPA, high efficiency particulate air filters, are made from very tiny glass fibers that are made into a tightly woven paper. This type of air filter can remove at least 99.97% of dust, pollen, mold, bacteria, and any airborne particles with a size of 0.3 microns. Particles that are larger or smaller are trapped with even higher efficiency. A pre-filter is sometimes used in air purifiers to prolong the life of the HEPA filter. Particles of all sizes are filtered by either straining, the particle is larger than the gap between the woven glass fibers, so they are trapped. Impingement, they collide and stick to the glass fibers. Interception, uh, the inertia of the particles carries them into the fibers. Airflow uh, may differ. Diffusion, this is where it captures the small particles. They travel erratically, so they're more likely to hit a fiber. And this explains why the HEPA filters can filter many particles smaller than 0.3 microns. If we overlay the HEPA filter on the chart of efficiency of filtering, you can see that greater than 99.7 particles greater than the 0.3 microns are filtered out. And remember, it can also filter smaller particles via diffusion. MERV, which is a minimum efficiency reporting value, is a rating system primarily used for HVAC air cleaners and a rating created by the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning and Engineers, or ASHRAE. A MERV rating reports a filter's ability to capture larger particles between categories of 0.3 and 1, 1 to 3, and 3 to 10 microns. The higher the MERV rating, 1 to 20, the better the filter is at trapping specific types of particles. A filter with a MERV of 17 and above will trap 99.97% of particles of the smallest size category, 0.3 to 1. If we overlay a MERV 8 filter on the chart of efficiency of filtering, you can see that 70-85% of particles, 3 to 10 microns, are filtered out. If we overlay a MERV 12 filter, greater than 80% of the particles, 1 to 3 microns in size, and greater than 90% of 3 to 10 micron particle sizes are filtered. And a MERV 16 filter captures more than 95% of the particles greater than 0.3 microns in diameter. And as we've said, the MERV 17 or higher traps 99.97% of particles 0.3 microns and larger, similar to most HEPA filters. Activated carbon filters consist of a vast system of pores of various molecular sizes. These pores are highly adsorbent, forming a strong chemical bond or attraction to odorous, gaseous, and liquid contaminants, especially organic chemicals and compounds. Studies have also shown that air purification systems with activated carbon filters reduce airborne ozone compared to those without. UV ultraviolet light. Ultraviolet germicidal irradiation is a method of disinfection that uses short wavelength of ultraviolet light to inactivate or kill microorganisms and pathogens by damaging their RNA and DNA. UVGI is the use of UV light 
with sufficiently short wavelengths to disinfect surfaces, air, and water. The UVC wavelength of 253.7 nanometers has proven to be effective at neutralizing or inactivating microorganisms. The challenge is that the wavelength can cause skin and eye irritation or damage and needs to be shielded when used in occupied spaces. Some air purification systems and extraoral suction devices are combining filtration with UVGI as an added insurance. In some cases, the air purification system purposely uses a lower CFM airflow, low-level filters to allow particles to reach the UVC light, and a parallel airflow to the light in order to allow a longer exposure time to the UVGI, also termed dwell time. An ionizer is a device that disperses negatively and or positively charged ions into the air. Virtually all particles in the air have either a positive or negative charge. Most pollutants naturally have a positive charge. The created negative ions magnetically attach to particles in the air, creating clusters that may be filtered or attached to nearby surfaces such as walls or furniture, or attached to one another and settle out of the air, preventing it from being airborne. This can result in reductions in airborne microbials, neutralization of odors, fine particulates, and specific volatile organic compounds. Ionizers can be used locally with standalone units or installed within your HVAC system for total surface air and surface sanitation. This centralized system shown has ozone removal and an automated feedback and monitoring system. Photocatalytic oxidation is another form of ionization and is achieved when UV rays are combined with a titanium dioxide coated filter. This process creates hydroxyl radicals and superoxide ions, which are highly reactive electrons. These highly reactive electrons aggressively combine with other elements in the air, such as bacteria and volatile organic compounds. Once bound together, the chemical reaction takes place between the supercharged ion and the pollutant effectively oxidizing or burning the pollutant. This breaks the pollutant down into harmless carbon dioxide and water molecules, making the air more purified. Electrolyzed water is produced by the electrolysis of water and salt. The generated result is a mildly acidic form of chlorine known as hypochlorous acid which happens to be the foundation of the human immune system. In contact with the pollutant, it oxidizes it. The vinegar lowers the pH or the acidity of the solution so that the right amounts of hypochlorous acid and sodium hydroxide are created. Electrolyzed alkaline ionized water loses its potency fairly quickly, so it cannot be stored for long. Negative pressure rooms, which are engineered to control infection, are used in hospitals and medical clinics to prevent the spread of contagious illnesses from one area to another. Air is pumped out of the treatment area, creating a negatively pressured space. So, for example, when a door is opened into that space from the hallway or the lobby, the air rushes in instead of out. Studies suggest directing airflow through a negative pressure isolation room is a preferred model for protecting healthcare workers during patient care, especially when aerosols are involved. For a negative pressure room, the sum of the mechanically exhausted air must exceed the sum of the mechanically supplied air. In a negative pressure room, air should flow from hallways and corridors, clean areas, into the isolation rooms, less clean areas. While a negative pressure isolation is considered the best method of infection control, installation of this negative pressure room can be cost prohibitive to private dental practices. Remember, when considering any air management system, Consider layering and bundling to maximize efficiency and effectiveness. Some of the important criteria to review when considering implementing air management systems. Consider the method of treatment to effectively and efficiently remove the pollutants created in the dental office. Consider solutions that are capable of removing dust, VOCs, mold, bacteria, odors, as well as inactivating germs and viruses. Also consider local as well as centralized solutions. Cubic feet per minute is the most common way to measure airflow. The cubic feet per minute, CFM, determines how much cubic feet of air can be moved or exchanged each minute. A room measuring 1,000 cubic feet would need a 1,000 CFM system to replace all the air each minute. 
It is important to understand the cubic feet per minute that each system can handle and how often it can turn over the dental office air. Consider the size of the rooms or the spaces. If you have standard eight foot ceilings, you can essentially measure the length times width and compare with the product specifications. But ideally, it is best to consider cubic feet and take into account ceiling height and whether you have an open or closed floor plan. Air change rate or air changes per hour is a measure of the air volume added to or removed from a space divided by the volume of space. If the air in the space is either uniform or perfectly mixed, air changes per hour is a measure of how many times the air within a defined space is replaced. In a situation like this, it can be calculated by 60 times the airflow in CFM divided by the volume of room. On consumer models, you may see a similar but not exactly the same rating called clean air delivery rates. For instance, let's take a look at one air purifier. It has four CFM settings, 144, 230, 294, and 383 cubic feet per minute. Assuming an average operatory may be 10 by 12 with 8 foot ceiling, the room then has 960 cubic feet of volume. At the lowest speed of this particular air purifier, taking 60 times the CFM level of 144 and dividing by the room volume provides approximately nine air change rates per hour. At the highest speed of this particular air purifier, taking 60 times the CFM level of 383 and dividing by the room volume provides approximately 24 air changes uh, per hour. Most recommendations in a healthcare environment recommend six to 12 air changes per hour. However, new regulations may recommend higher in the future. The movement of air generates sound, yet it should not be so loud as to infringe on the working dental environment. The unit for measuring the relative intensities of sound on a logarithmic scale is called a decibel. Typically, on air purification systems that have multiple airflow settings, the greater the airflow, the greater the sound level. If an air purification system is too loud and needs to be turned down to a lower level, the airflow capacity and efficacy will both be reduced. A sound level of 50 decibels or lower is desired, the average sound of a quiet dishwasher. Normal conversation is around 60 decibels, and the use of high-speed handpieces and ultrasonic scalers can create sound in the range of 60 to 99 decibels. Long-term operational costs must be considered, and not just the purchasing price. All air management systems have different components of various prices that need replacing with varying frequencies and usage over time, such as filters and UV light bulbs. It is important to understand the frequency of needing to replace all these parts and their associated costs. An inexpensive unit today may soon become quite expensive to own and use over time. I know we have given you a lot of information and you know every dental office is unique from its square footage, the environment, you know, open or closed, patient flow, number of team members, and number of aerosol producing procedures performed. Your air management needs will also be just as unique and there's no simple recipe. So please utilize these resources provided to decide what is right for you, your team, and your patients. Consider the office environment and the use of infection control bundling and or layering of protective methods, both localized and centralized. Control the source of aerosol generation, ventilation of the air through high volume intraoral and extraoral suction, and air cleaning measures through centralized HVAC and or standalone air purification systems. Please contact your Henry Schein representative for more information on these technologies. And as always, if you have any comments, questions, or concerns, or ideas for future episodes, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. And please subscribe to the YouTube page of Henry Shine by clicking the little button down there, subscribe. And as always, until we see you again, stay safe and stay informed.